Okay, so morning every, everyone. We are starting the second day of the, of the meeting and uh, we welcome Mark Rast from the University of Colorado. Who is, it's yeah. working, it's working. It's working. It's working, I am already made. So he's going to talk about deciphering the solar convection. All right, uh, so uh, thanks everybody for coming uh, early this morning. Uh, thanks, Jan and uh, everybody else that was involved in organizing this, it's great. Um, uh, Kate and, uh, and, and uh, Robin, I don't see them, but um, I wanted to thank them. I can't, I can't uh, imagine how bittersweet uh, this all is for them. And I'd like to just relay one real quick story about Mike. I met Mike um, over 30 years ago. I was a a uh, f first year graduate student when I met Mike in a in a meeting in the in the conference room off at Jill, the Jilla Library and I couldn't figure out what he was talking about uh, when he gave his talk and uh, and then subsequently we had the joy of of both um, bringing our our oldest uh, sons into the world Kate and Mike and and Christy and myself and um, it's all it's all incredibly short when you think about it, it goes incredibly fast. But the story I wanted to relate really is, um, I was in Santa Barbara, uh, because Yuri uh, was generous enough to have me stay as a graduate student at the Helioseismology um, Santa Barbara, I forget what it's called, ITP at the time. Um, and anyway, I, uh, I submitted my first uh, paper, um, and uh, you know, it was to a conference proceedings, and, and I said to Mike, you know, I'm really nervous because uh, I'm hoping it's correct, right? And uh, and Mike said to me, uh, he said to me, well, if it's important enough, uh, somebody will check it. And uh, nobody's ever actually checked it, so that shows how important it was. But that's not the point of the story. I guess the point of the story is I've never forgotten that because we've all heard about how Mike was really very uh, tuned into uh, the individual, but he also had this deep understanding that science is goes beyond the individual and the ego, and that we all make contributions and we move it forward. And I've never, I've never uh, forgotten that um, that lesson from Mike. So, so thanks, Mike. And um, and today, um, I'd like to uh, talk to you all a little bit uh, about solar convection. I have a lot here, it's probably too long. Um, so we'll go as far as I can. The, the new stuff is at the end, so that makes it a little bit problematic. But in any case, uh, first we'll talk about uh, the convective scales observed on the sun. Then we'll talk about this, this issue about the convective conundrum. And really, to me, that's a question of why supergranulation, why we see supergranulation at, the, at its zeroth level, zeroth order. And then we'll, I'll talk a little bit about a model for, for the upper super adiabatic layers and stars. And finally, just very briefly point to a poster by Piyush. If I don't get to do that, uh, Piyush is doing some really interesting work applying SOLA inversions to spectropolymetric data. Okay, so just as a, we've seen lots of pictures of the sun, of course, the outer 30% of the sun uh, is convectively unstable. And the only thing I wanted to point out uh, is that the, the dominant physical feature of, of the solar envelope, the convective envelope, is its extreme stratification. And, and, I, and I love this plot that, that Oki Norland put together because you can see uh, on a log-log plot uh, the surface that we observe, the optically thick layer down to three uh, megameters, and then 20 megameters uh, which uh, is roughly the scale of supergranulation, and then 200 megameters at the base of the convection zone. And you can easily see that the density changes by a factor of an order of a million, and the pressure by 10 to the 8. And even uh, by 20 megameters, it changes by factors of 10 to the 4 and 10 to the 6. Okay? So at the base of the convection zone, the scale height is about the half the depth of the convection zone. and Stratification is really uh, one of the dominant features of solar convection. So in the photosphere itself, 
we'll see that the spectrum is continuous. We see motions at all scales, but we historically and traditionally uh, thought of four types, four scales of motion. Uh, and, I, and I put some comments here, and we're gonna, I'm gonna focus mostly on the supergranulation and the granulation, uh, but let's go just really quickly through this. We have the smallest scale granulation, uh, about a one megameter, and it's really uh, the radiative boundary layer dynamics. It's a radiatively cooled boundary layer, and granulation is really dominated by uh, the dynamics of a radiatively cooled boundary layer. And in fact, the simulations are incredibly successful, and in my opinion, the reason they're successful is you really only need two ingredients to get the granulation right. You need to radiatively cool, and you need to have an open boundary condition uh, that, that Oki uh, Nordland introduced uh, some time ago, and those two combinations allow you to produce dynamics in that radiative boundary layer that's uninhibited by the dynamics below. A mesogranulation, which is uh, transient and elusive, and there's still arguments about whether it's truly a scale of convection, but again, we see a continuous scale of motions in the, in, on the sun. Um, I, I, I believe that, but I'm not going to talk about it today, that it's probably a manifestation of the collective behavior of granules, and that's why it's so linked to the time scale at which you, observe, you tend to observe it and the length scale that you observe. Then we have supergranulation, and supergranulation is very curious. It's very prominent in observations. It's not captured by any simulations, and that's, to me, the, one of the key uh, points of the convective conundrum. And it's not due to the depth of the second ionization of helium. In fact, uh, I can talk to you later in more detail. It probably ref reflect, uh, if there is any influence of ionization, it's uh, the driving between the two depths of the first and second ionization of helium that you can see in the signature in the photosphere, okay? And then finally, uh, giant cells, and giant cells are almost the exact opposite. They're very prominent in simulations and almost impossible to observe um, in, in real life on the real sun. Okay, so granulation, just uh, very quickly, is well simulated. Uh, there's still some really interesting uh, details. Uh, as you get to higher and higher uh, resolution, this is a hydrodynamic simulation. This is courtesy of Matthias. Uh, you can see that the asymmetry in the, in the intensity, in other words, dark and bright regions, which typically reflect upflow and downflowing uh, regions, uh, starts going away as you go to higher and higher uh, resolutions. This was, for, this was pointed out by Oki. Uh, Oski Steiner um, in, in Sac Peak at the last workshop. And moreover, if you go to a, a small-scale dynamo simulation, you get more closely a representation of the distribution of intensity that, that you observe um, with very high-resolution observations, and these from, are from Valentin from the Sunrise Balloon observations. And so the only point here is even though we, had, we can model granulation very well, at high resolution, it looks like granulation is essentially magnetized, meaning there is no such thing as a hydrodynamic sun. And, and I'm going to talk for the rest of the talk about a hydrodynamic sun. And so this is really a warning uh, to everybody that there is no such thing as a hydrodynamic sun. It's a, it's a magnetized uh, plasma. Um, hopefully not, but you can. You're welcome to if, if that's what you need to do, and I wouldn't blame you at all. Uh, uh, simulations have, have gotten very good. These are some heroic simulations uh, uh, done, um, published this year, and they extend, this one here is a, is a local area model extending from the base of the convection zone to 1.01 solar radii, radii on a non-uniform grid. And uh, similarly, uh, deep uh, layer truncated, typically, as, 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 as deep models typically are, and then a spherical uh, model, which is truncated at 0.99, the solar radiation, uh, uh, um, radius, and has an artificial cooling layer. And you can see here this effect of stratification with the very small scales at the top and the very large scales at the bottom, and I'll come back to this simulation and what it gets right and what it gets wrong. Um, later. 
Okay, and then we have supergranulation, and again, very quickly, supergranulation is easy to observe, particularly if you look sort of in, in, in a chromospheric uh, uh, line like calcium uh, 2K here, you can see uh, these vertices of the supergranulation that are swept into the supergranulation network. You can see that network through across the whole sun, and you can also see supergranulation, of course, in Doppler images. Okay, so, so what is the convective conundrum? Uh, the convective conundrum really um, uh, is uh, that all simulations of solar convection produce lower wave, uh, produce higher low wave number convective amplitudes than observed by the sun. And so uh, neither local radiative magnetohydrodynamic models nor global spherical shell models get the spectrum of horizontal motions correctly. And I'm talking specifically about the spectrum of horizontal motions. This is uh, from David Hathaway. This is a spectrum of motions. And it's very important to realize that what's being plotted here is vertical motions at the smallest scales of granulation and horizontal motions at the uh, larger scales. Okay? And this is an approximate uh, representation of what all models produce. Okay? And so this, this uh, deficit in power, if the sun did what models produce, giant cells would be seen with a vengeance. We would see the calcium collecting in the inner network of giant cells, okay, in the network of giant cells, all right? So the fact that we see supergranulation, which sits here, and we don't see very easily larger scale motions um, is, is the essence of the convective conundrum. Okay, and it, so like I said, if models were correct, and these are some more models by uh, Hideyuki uh, Hota, and um, you can see that the power would be very apparent in giant cells compared to supergranules. Okay, so back to these most recent models, because they show very well this problem. They continue to show a monotonically increasing uh, power to low wave numbers, and the reason for that, I would suggest, is that they get the fundamental superadiabaticity of the convection zone wrong. And that's what I'd like to uh, convince you of. I think this, the convection zone really has a superadiabaticity that's tiny, even tinier than the models produce, all the way through up until the upper 10 megameters. Okay? And the reason for that, that, they, that I believe modeling gets it wrong, is because there's too much horizontal diffusion of temperature perturbations. So if you drive plumes out of the photosphere through the layer, you re-stratify the layer, and then that superadiabaticity drives large-scale motions that aren't seen in the photosphere. That's the essence of, of what I'm trying to convince you of. OK, so let me go into a little more details. We, uh, Matthias, uh, Jesse Lord, uh, a graduate student, and I uh, tried to look at supergranulation. The motivation was actually to see what the network effect was on supergranulation. Uh, but in any case, we did uh, these very large simulations, um, and we made them large horizontally because we were thinking initially that you need large horizontal domains to capture large horizontal scales. And the very first thing we learned uh, in doing those simulations is that you, don't, you not only need large horizontal domains to capture large horizontal scales, but you need deep domains to capture large horizontal scales. So this is two megameters deep, the red line, all the way up to 20 megameters deep, and we did uh, even deeper ones. And what you notice is that the spectrum of horizontal motions in the photosphere feel the depth of the domain, okay? And so uh, if, you don't go, if you don't go deep enough, the spectrum of horizontal motions rolls off not because uh, the real spectrum of motions on the sun uh, drops off, but because you're not deep enough to drive the largest scales in your simulation, okay? And so uh, large scales are driven deep, and small scales are driven shallow, and there's a mixing length-like dependence of the integral scale of driving, the buoyancy driving scale, um, to the, uh, based on the local scale height. And that integral scale is relatively easy to understand. Um, it follows exactly from an argument that, that Occy made some years ago. And it said, look, if you have a 
cylinder, for example, of a one density scale height and height, and you're bringing fluid up into it, uh, some mass flux into the bottom of the cylinder, in order for the density to drop off by a factor of, of one over E, you have to turn over uh, essentially all of that fluid over one t density scale height. And so if you say the fluid running outside of the cylinder is approximately equal to the mass entering the bottom, you get a radius scale for that horizontal scale of overturning, and that horizontal scale is four times uh, the density scale height at any depth. And we did this in much more detail. We can, in fact, from the vertical uh, velocity spectrum at any depth, uh, compute the horizontal velocity spectrum effectively using this argument, okay? And I didn't, I cut those slides this morning uh, in, uh, for, to save some time, okay? But I'm happy to talk to you about those. And so this raises a, a crazy idea that perhaps the buoyancy driving in the solar convection zone is very shallow. And so we did an experiment where we put an artificial flux profile that dropped off at 10 megameters. In other words, we had something artificially carrying the heat in our energy equation up to about 10 megameters, and from then on we let convection take over. And when you do that, instead of the, the spectrum continuously to increase monotonically, it rolls over this blue one, okay? And moreover, when you do structure tracking, the black here is MDI structure tracking, the red is what you get if you don't use this artificial flux, you just have the full simulation, it monotonically increases. And if you uh, drive only 10 megameters and above, it rolls over nicely and matches observations. Okay, so this is strongly suggestive that supergranulation is the largest buoyantly driven scale on the sun. And that the stratification in the deep interior of the convection zone is nearly adiabatic. So why 10 megameters? How am I doing on time? Oh, why 10 megameters? Well, uh, there's a bunch of different possibilities. Uh, the lower convection zone is radiatively heated. Uh, the radiative diffusion doesn't drop to zero. I couldn't find the reference this morning, but I know Nigel Weiss worked on this, but this is actually a fairly uh, unexplored problem. Okay, this is a fairly unexplored problem, uh, and we need to have deep relax. This is a difficult simulation to do where we have a radiative conductivity that's a function of the physical parameters rather than position. There's also a possibility that the deep motions are rotationally constrained, and it was nicely demonstrated by uh, Nick Featherstone and Brad Heineman that if you inc uh, lower the Rossby number, you can roll over uh, the spectrum. Finally, it's possible that the deep magnetic fields in the sun, the large-scale magnetic fields, suppress convective amplitudes. And the one I wanted to talk to you about, and I'm running out of time, is that perhaps solar convection is even more non-local than simulations suggest. So let me do that. Uh, we did a set of experiments that uh, basically uh, had an adiabatic domain and drove plumes through that adiabatic domain and asked what's the mean stratification depending on the filling factor and, and entropy of those plumes that were driving off the layer. And you can see as the entropy and filling factor of the plumes gets less, you get, you become adiabatic much quicker in the interior of the domain. In fact, all you really have is a geometric superposition of the cool downflowing entropy fluid on the adiabatic domain, and that produces a super adiabatic layer that's just the geometric sum of those. So you can do a model um, of the super adiabatic layer of a convective envelope by just measuring, you can get the mean state by just measuring the entropy fluctuations and filling factor of the granular downflows. And so I took 37 stars here from, from Reiner's collection and asked, can I reproduce these profiles simply by measuring the filling factor and entropy fluctuation in the photosphere at some height? And the answer is, amazingly, all you have to do is add up the entropy of the downflows to the entropy of the upflows, 
you don't need to account for any mixing because mixing is a bit of a red herring. So long as you mix but you don't diffuse, you just get a straight uh, geometric sum and you can make a correction and you can fit uh, those profiles exactly to some accuracy. What you can do is you can fit about 29 of the 37 of them uh, to, uh, with an error uh, of about 3%. And I'm going fast here. I'm happy to share this with, with, with you. What you can see is that you have some problem where log G is high and you have a little problems uh, where the effective temperature is very low. And you can understand at this end, this radiative correction, which is sort of ad hoc, is off. And at this end here, the downflow plumes are too cool. But through a large bulk of this domain, you can calculate the mean entropy profile just knowing the filling factor and entropy fluctuations of the granular downflow plumes. Um, OK. And from that, you can estimate what the size of supergranulation is on those stars. Um, and, you, and you see a very wide range of where, at what depth, what is 4-H rho at the depth where that entropy fluctuation essentially vanishes. OK, so is there any observational test of this crazy idea? And the one I wanted to share with you is that uh, the size of supergranulation actually changes with the solar cycle. And it does so in a very weird way. Supergranulation gets bigger as the, sol as the sun gets more active. Typically, you think of magnetoconvection that the cell sizes get smaller as the magnetic field goes up. But supergranulation actually gets bigger as the sun gets more active. And you can see that here over, uh, over uh, almost two cycles. And the question then is, so does this depth of this superadiabatic region on the sun breathe as the sun gets more active. And that would be a test of whether this idea is correct that supercranulation comes from this 10 megameter deep superadiabatic layer. And so uh, I took uh, uh, four simulations from Matthias, a local dynamo, and with more and more field. And I asked, how does the, how does the, the density scale height change with each of these models? And, you know, so here's a plot of, of the entropy. You can see that the, indeed the superadiabatic region is going deeper as you make the, as you make the model uh, more magnetic. And so here you can, this is just a com combination of these points, and you can see that as you make the model more magnetic, the scale height uh, increases for any given entropy. OK? And so indeed, as the sun gets more magnetic, the superadiabatic region deepens. 4-H rho increases slightly, and the supergranulation gets bigger. In fact, the real problem with this and why it's not published is this effect is too large, OK? And it would predict a larger increase in the, in the supergranulation than is actually observed. And so uh, that's the next thing to address. Um, Finally, uh, I want to point to Piyush's poster. I don't see Piyush, but he's there. Um, I think Mike would love this, so I want us to, to stop here and take a tiny bit of time. What Piyush is doing is taking spectropolymetric data. In, in spectropolarimetry, you have a response function, which is essentially the sensitivity kernel. Those functions are not orthogonal or linearly independent. That's cuts through here. So this is a, a response function plot as a function of wavelength. So Piyush is orthogonalizing those and then using them to create uh, kernels, averaging kernels, and then doing multivariable uh, inversions uh, and possibly iterating uh, the, the, the basic model guess. And I think this is uh, a transition from geophysics to helioseismology to spectropolarimetry. Uh, that Mike would really love. So I'll stop there. Oh, any, <clears throat> any questions? Hi, Mike. 
Uh, I have a question. When you put your layer at 10 megameter by putting this radiative flux to confine it to, I'm wondering to which extent uh, the simulation doesn't correspond to one where you will have done the box only to 10 megameter because you said at the beginning of your talk that if you don't make the box deep enough, then you don't capture the scale and you get uh, the spectrum to be. So right. I wanted to, com to know if you were making the 10 megameter uh, depth box compared to the one that is deeper where you have put the radiative flux, do you get the same kind of behavior and are you not actually getting back the fact that you have done in practice a smaller uh, box you see in depth? No, I actually haven't plotted those right on top of each other, but that's, that's I actually haven't plotted those on top of each other. Great question. Um, but what I can say is the motions don't stop. I cut it out because of time again. I think I cut it out. No, I didn't. You can see here that you still have uh, motions. Uh, you've just reduced the amplitude of the RMS amplitude of the motions in the deep layer. So you're just changing the energy equation, and so you're changing the amplitude of the motions in the deep area. And by continuity, that means the horizontal flows in the upper layer are lower. So it's not as a, it's not effectively putting a, a lid on the bottom of the box. It's actually an artificial way to reduce the amplitude of the motions in the deep layer. Since I woke up, <laughs> never went to sleep. Um, what is the mechanism that takes care of your artificial flux? Yes, yeah, so. Aside from declaring it. So this is just an experiment um, that has uh, that has little basis in, in reality other than uh, it's an experiment. Um, and the idea is that one of, one of these four things actually effectively, so effectively changes the convection zone into a continuously driven convection zone throughout its depth to one in which you have driven convection in the upper 10 megameters and uh, basically overshoot through an adiabatic layer below. Okay, and so if you can, so we know that the granular flows can carry the convective flux. The mass and entropy fluctuations of the granular flows are sufficient to transport the flux. So if we can get those flows to the bottom of the convection zone without re-stratifying it, we would have basically a completely non-local model for convection, one which short circuits the the photosphere and the bottom of the convection zone. And, all, and that's what this suggests, that we have a short-circuited convection zone, basically, that's essentially adiabatic in the interior. But there's other ways to suppress the amplitude of large-scale mo motions in the deep convection zone. One of them is by rotationally constraining those. Possibly magnetic fields can constrain those. Certainly, radiative heating of the lower portion of the convection zone will change its mean stratification. So I emphasize this very extreme case because you can indeed reproduce the shallow uh, numerical experiments by taking uh, the plume filling factor and entry fluctuation of the plumes from the granulation and get the mean stratification. Whether that indeed holds all the way to the bottom, um, I haven't shown at all. I've just emphasized that particular possibility. Hey, Mark. What is it that makes the interior adiabatic in the first place? Yeah, so I was thinking more because we talked about this very briefly uh, yesterday. So I'll make a cartoon and wave my hands, and then I'll either fly off the platform or, or I'll just walk off in embarrassment. Okay, but uh, imagine you had, imagine you had very, had zero diffusivity experiment, a truly zero thermal diffusivity experiment. And you initiate convection in a stratified layer. Initially, you would have all scales of motion driven. That convection would drive the mean state to adiabatic, okay? And the only place that you would maintain a super adiabaticity would be in the boundary layer, in the radiative boundary layer. And now you'd set up this condition, okay? You've driven by some transient the mean state to adiabatic and the deep, and then you've maintained the transport of the flux by raining all this small crap down through the convection zone. 
Right. Yes, exactly. This is not new. I hope I, I, I'm, I'm sorry if I implied this. What this is is an extreme form of convection where the transit time across the layer is much shorter than the diffusive time uh, in, the, in the fluid. Okay? And then you're, you're completely non-local. Okay? And the trouble is with the numerical experiments is we're not, in that, we're not in that state. So we not only mix, physically mix parcels, but we diffuse them. And so we change the mean entropy, not by just the geometric addition of a hot and cold thing next to each other, but by increasing uh, the entropy by diffusing, okay? And therefore, we re-stratify the domain, and we end up with, a, with an entry BP profile that's like this, right? That's re this is, in my opinion, and I haven't, I haven't demonstrated, this shape is the di direct result of thermal diffusion of the downflowing plumes, okay? S thank you, Mark. That, that was fantastic. Uh, one, one comment and one question. The, the comment is that with this, the velocities in the particle convection zone would be much reduced, and that would be consistent with what uh, Travan talked about yesterday. So I think that's an important point in support of this. The, the question is, what is it going to do to the penetration at the base of the convection zone? Yeah. Because there's nothing going on there, so there won't be any penetration. Yeah, that's a great question. And moreover, there's a real conceptual hiccup here because you dump all that cold stuff down here on granular tiny little blobs, at some point you've got to diffuse it, right? So what is that interface, right? Maybe it's the radiative heating interface where you actually put the luminosity of the sun into heating all this small scale stuff as opposed to diffusing it with it to its neighbor. But I, again, these are guesses, these are not these are not uh, demonstrations. Okay, so unfortunately we have to cut here, but I, I request uh, that you will be available in the coffee break, of course, because there are many more questions. So thank you again to the speaker. Yeah. Yeah, so now we will uh, receive Yvonne Esworth, who is going to talk about my favorite topic. So solar Garcia modes in the sun and the stars. Go. Sorry, solar G modes. Up to those who don't know and will become clear in the talk, I have to try that Rafa is still talking to me at the end of this. Yeah. Very important. Okay, so um, my question, what's going on in the solar core? The answer is we need a probe, seeing as how I'm an observer. Um, I need a probe that's actually um, sensitive to the conditions there and at the same time observable. And we need a way to interpret the data, and that's inversions, which I'm, well, I'll mention a little bit, but not very much. Okay, so as I'm sure you know by now, two sorts of modes can propagate in stars, and these stars, labeled by their restoring force, we have pressure compressibility or buoyancy gravity waves. Um, P modes have been well observed and discussed. We haven't seen that many this time, but... Um, you know, they're well, well known. The problem with G modes is that they are, we believe, strong in the center, but they've got a problem propagating through the convection zone. And if you're in a condition where you can get mode coupling, then you can get mixed modes, and that's clearly true in some stars, um, but not in the sun. So uh, I will talk a little bit about other stars, but my main focus here is the extremely controversial G modes in the sun. So there's a um, solar spectrum of P-modes, bison data. Uh, it could be any of the people who make these measurements, or at least the velocity measurements, um, because it sort of all looks the same. And um, I'm not also going to tell you how long the data set is. I don't have a clue, actually, for this one, because, again, it doesn't make much difference what it looks like. Um, it's not showing you the fundamental. The fundamental is down um, around... 250 microhertz or so, nowhere near where the strength of the oscillations are. This is 3,000 microhertz. 
So we're looking in at high overtone P modes. Um, if you went to um, another sort of star, um, which I'm not going to talk about, but possibly will be later, um, if you look at G modes, then, sorry, if you look at white dwarfs, you see lots of G modes. Um, and um, as I understand it too, you see changes with epoch, and so you can actually begin to talk about changes in structure. Absolutely wonderful, um, but sadly the solar case doesn't look like that. Um, if you're looking at a red giant branch star, then you can begin to get G modes because in this case, what you're actually seeing is mixed modes. The frequency at which the P modes will come is very similar to the frequency at which the G modes in the center exist. Because of the very high density in the center, the brunt Weissala frequency is changed and therefore you can get mixing. And the picture we have here shows you some labeling of the modes. The red line is a magnified um, average across the spectrum to show you roughly what the mode envelope really is. Um, the radial mode is the noughts. The twos are the quadrupole mode. Um, in principle, that is mixed, but because of the nature of G modes, you don't see the spacing, not with the even wonderful data that we now have, it's rather hard to see. Um, and the dipole modes are shown with the one on top of them, and you can see they're clearly split. This is a reasonably high frequency one down the bottom of the RGB. So G modes are there. They're not just a figment of someone's imagination. Um, we can really observe them. They're goodies. And uh, obviously we learn from the G mode, mixed mode observations of red giant stars where helium burning has commenced, what we can say about rotation in the core, and it provides really great constraints for the models of the interior. We would love to do that on the sun. That would be really nice. Now, there's been various um, work done on this, and uh, Thierry Apuchot is not here, but he's and continues to drive a lot of the collaborative work on this. And he points out that um, high-quality data on the P modes have gone from strength to strength over 30 years. This was 2010. Attempts to detect G modes much more elusive. And it's in stark contrast with the fact that we can pick up G modes right across the HR diagram. Why do we really care about G modes? I have some um, selected, carefully selected, um, kinetic energy density profiles for a model sun, showing you a few order, few low order dipole P and G modes. So in the bottom row, I've got P modes, um, nice and strong in the outer regions, and with the exception of the P1, which we're nowhere near, um, getting vanishingly small when we look at the pressure modes on the surface. And you then have to remember these are fairly low frequency modes. The spectrum I showed you was up at around 3,000. Um, we are pushing down to try and get with the um, pressure modes to get down to P1. I think we're probably down to about P6 by now. Um, so we haven't even got these goodies. If we had the G modes, they're strongest in the center. So that really does begin to constrain what goes on there and answer some of the questions that really interest us. So it's a problem for the sun because of the this, um, evanescent, in the G modes are evanescent in the convective zone and hence very small at the surface. Mode coupling doesn't work because of the very different um, frequency regimes. And we keep on trying. Just because something's difficult, we don't stop doing it. So what I want to try and show you here is some of the perhaps theoretical predictions and then some of the attempts people have made to try and detect them. And the incredibly positive spin-off that has come from these exercises. So models predict that the typical frequencies would be a few hundred microhertz. Um, 
that's really tricky because of solar noise and instrumental noise, both of which we can think about how we might get round. Modes would be equally spaced in period, okay, unlike the P modes that I showed you that were in e roughly equally spaced in frequency. The amplitudes are small, perhaps one centimeter per second. Some of the predictions go down a lot of noughts lower than that. Um, you might argue that the lifetimes are long, which means that modes are very narrow, which actually helps you, but that's only a theoretical viewpoint, and some of the data suggests that maybe that's not true. And um, you've also got to consider what rotation there is there, and possibly even magnetic fields, actually, and what that says about what the impact of that is on the mode um, splittings, and Opinion is divided, I think is fair to say. Um, on that, we might be seeing things that are higher than in the radiative zone or lower. Don't know. Okay, so a little bit of history. I've been giving you all the ifs and buts and some of the difficulties and the constraint. There's the 160 minute, which actually I think was mentioned yesterday. Um, it was one of the early observations of um, the low degree, the whole sun observations and was incredibly exciting. It was published in Nature. You sit and you think, okay, 160 minutes, that gets you into G-mode regions. Have we discovered G-modes? I suspect that it's the ninth harmonic of the day. There's a huge effort been put into, is it precisely the ninth harmonic of the day, or is it just a little bit different, in which case it could be real? could be solar. And for someone who is very much no longer here, but I was reminded of him with Jan saying a comment and a question, which was one of George Isaac's real trademarks. Um, the sun is not a physics experiment. It does not necessarily repeat. Okay, so just because the modern data, which are really good and much more continuous, don't show this signal does not mean it wasn't there in the past. However, I think it's so close that it probably is the ninth harmonic of the day and not the detection of a G mode. However, it had a great spin-off in that it led to the proposal for and selection of golf, which was set up to measure G modes. So that was a real positive. There was also, uh, led by Thierry Apershaw in the late 1990s, a uh, Phoebus consortium. Phoebus uh, is a sun god who rode his chariot across the sky from morning to evening. Um, and the aim there was to be collaborative, to pool the existing data and look for coincidences to try and beat down the noise. And many of the key observational and instrumental people groups participated and it explored a range of different ways, some of which are still in use, for producing a trustable signal out of the noise. Our bottom line on this was an upper limit, no detected G modes. So again, to quote Thierry, although we cannot identify any G mode signature, we nevertheless have a firm upper limit, and the upper limit is given there, um, 10 millimeters per second or below um, 0.1 parts per million in 0.5, sorry, in intensity. Think about that just for a minute as the fact this is a Doppler measurement, V upon C. So put one 10 millimeters, one centimeter per second in the speed of light, and it's phenomenal precision. It really is. Um, I, the group I, I'm in in Birmingham used to be called high resolution spectroscopy, and that's the reason. Um, if you think about this in terms of what the surface motion would be, again, it's very, very small. So um, Golf joined in 2010, and a big, there's a very big review article which um, I can recommend you to reading, uh, but the conclusion was still no detectable G modes. Then, uh, well, before that, um, the Golf instrument data um, published a paper led by Sylvain Turkchez, um, looked at 1290 days of golf data and looked in the frequency range just above 150 microhertz to try and um, avoid some of the solar noise. 
and use the interesting statistical test. Okay, if you have a single, a single very sharp line, then um, it, you have to work quite hard to say, is that signal or is that noise? The signal levels you need are really quite high. So let's use the fact that we know that there will almost certainly be rotational splitting and all the rest, and therefore there are probably multiplets. So let's improve our statistical chances by looking for multiplets. And here is some data from their paper. So the different, it, there's a spectrum around the region that they were interested in. And the different horizontal lines are now limits for um, a frequentist approach and saying, what would I believe if something's above this? Has it got um, a 90% confidence chance that it's not due to noise? And the different colors are what you do when you add in multiplets. So when you say, I look for the coincidence of three modes at where, roughly where I expect them to be, then um, you can lower your threshold. And this actually shows you the um, colored bar across there is their detection. I'm not sure I actually agree, but the statistics and one of the consequences of this is a discussion on Bayesian rather than frequentist approaches um, was that there genuinely were modes detected. This is the point where I have to tread very carefully. Um, again, with the golf data, looking for repeated structures. So again, saying we know something about these modes G-mode spacing should be equidistant in period. So what you can do is take two successive Fourier transforms and produce the so-called second spectrum. And I'll show you the data in a minute. Um, they found a peak at 24 minutes, which also required fast rotation of the core. Um, in my view, some of the doubts are raised because it also required significant line width. To, to actually fit the simulations, the extensive simulations that were done to support this. But as I understand it, it's still there. It's still there in the golf data. So um, this is theoretical predictions of what kind of period spacings you would see. So for the L equals one, um, so that's the bright red line here, you can see the, free, the periodicities in time that you would see are very consistent with the 24 minutes um, detected. And this is the data with the detection. So there is line width here, and that's an issue because we think we understand that G modes are quite sharp, that they, there are a few loss mechanisms in the radiative zone, and therefore, once excited, the modes keep going for a long time. Much more recently has been some work uh, with Eric Fossard also using the golf data, using a really, really neat method. Um, the idea is that, okay, it's really tricky to look at the low frequencies because of the noise from the sun and the noise from the instruments. But if there really is a mode, there's motions inside the, the sun, then they will influence the P modes that propagate there. So we look in the P-mode region of the spectrum for the influence of very much lower frequency G-modes. You can't just go looking for sidebands because of the line width of the P-modes that are significantly damped, and the strong ones have a lifetime of, I don't know, three days or so. So it's a bit tricky to look directly. But he decided to look at what's called the large spacing, which is related to the sound travel time. So if I go back to the spectrum, uh, I've got naught twos here, naught twos, naught twos, and a one and a rather small three. And the large spacing is the interval in frequency between modes of the same degree. So I could take it between the L1s or the L0s or the L2s, but as long as I'm consistent. So what they did was they took a short data set of about eight hours, which is enough to pick up the large spacing um, and look for regular structure in those data. So what they have is a time series, which is the frequency at which the, you measure the large spacing 
have taken every eight hours over a very long stretch of time. And again, you look for regular structure in those data, which they claim to find, and they have a core rotation rate of 3.8 times the radiative value. Now, this is in the very center where most of the data do not constrain the value. It's been um, a very long, t long term running discussion about what is the rotation in the center. Um, in the past, conferences have set me up against Eric to show our data and justify what we get out of it, but um, they're getting a high one, and they're getting an asymptotic period spacing, which is the thing that was in Rafa's discussion, which is now 34 minutes. And from this, they reckon, going back into the original data, that they can actually identify individual G modes. Is it seen in other analysis? Um, the answer is no. Um, Hannah Schunke and Apesho and Thierry Kobach looked at the golf data and didn't draw the same conclusion. We've looked in the bison data and don't draw the same conclusion. And to date, there are no independently confirmed results. But the method is lovely and has provoked a great deal of interest. So Phoebus has been resurrected. A new EC program is running, and it's been in inspired and invigorated by the FOSSAR claim. So, positives. We've driven a lot of innovation in detection methods. There's been new ideas and instrumentation to reduce the noise in the G-mode part of the spectrum, um, partly just by changing the instruments a bit, but also going for instruments where um, you have lots of different measurements at the same time, which are independent and therefore you can beat down the noise. Um, it has led us using the techniques to move down with the P-modes. We are way, way further down than we were when we started looking for the, uh, for the G-modes. And it's raised questions, obviously, theoretical questions about the nature of the G-modes themselves. Are they really long-lived? Uh, what are sensible model predictions for amplitudes and frequencies? And I'm reminded here for the search for gravitational radiation, which I've had some contacts with over the years, when the detection goal was always beyond the measurements until you actually get there. And they go overnight from being, well, maybe they're there to a stunning new window on the universe. So I don't absolutely rule out um, finding the ones from the sun. I'm nearly finished. This is coming up to my last slide. Um, I still have a question mark about what the rotation rate is in the center. I'd love to have been able to answer the question I put at the beginning. And Michael would have been really pleased too if we'd been able to take, give him some data so he could do the rotational inversion that would take us right down there, but sadly not to be. Thank you. Thank you. So, <clears throat> if there are any questions, we are still friends. Oh, good, I escape. Oh, no. I have a, a, an historical question. Uh, nine cycles per day is conceivable. Is there a signature in the same data for eight per day, 10 per day, seven? Uh, that's a very good question. Yes, all the harmonics are there. I think the odd ones, for a reason I can't remember, but the odd ones are stronger than the even ones. And therefore, the fact that you don't see eight is not crazy. Um, but it's a very good question. Nice talk, thank you very much. Um, I was wondering, you say maybe we would get there and detect the GMOs. Do you have any suggestions? What would we need in terms of instrumentation or data analysis that would get us there to detect the GMOs? Um, there are attempts to, for instance, get multiple sites, 50 running at a time, all right? So it can't be like bison sites as they are now. Uh, it would be very small footprint things, um, so that you're seeing um, a slightly different patch of atmosphere from each. And although you're stuck with the solar noise, um, 
you can get rid of some of the atmospheric noise. The solar noise itself is a function of where you are in the atmosphere, the height you are in the atmosphere, which is determined by um, the wavelength of which you measure and where you are on, if you're using an absorption line, where you are on that. And so there is quite a bit of work going on to look for where correlations start to disappear as a function of height. So again, that's a different instrumental approach. And I think Steve has probably worked on some of that, multi-height, and Stuart, multi-height instruments in the solar atmosphere, not for GMOs, but for other reasons. And one gets actually, there are linkages here to the convection discussion that we've just listened to, because we, what we want is the solar convection to be independent. And then the methods clearly, um, I don't know whether we'll get there or not. Uh, Yvonne, on your 160-minute slide, you misspelled Phil Shearer's name. I misspelled it? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, dear. What should I have done? I've, what, I've, I've missed an S out. I see you out. Mr. C out. Um, thank you. I will correct it. Um, I knew uh, it looked odd, actually. Sorry. Yeah, the uh, the P-mode analysis... The, um, that, uh, that Mike was leading uh, to infer inter internal rotation in the... Can you hear me? Hello? Yes. Uh, the P-mode analysis that uh, Mike was uh, leading uh, shortly before he passed away, uh, uh, inferring the core rotation using um, uh, P-mode frequencies, basically, seems to suggest, uh, to some extent, or with some confidence, that it's a boring result, that the rotation rate in the core is perhaps not altogether, as what I heard from Antia, for instance, uh, now, if that is the case, if that is borne out through by this analysis, are there other things that the G modes can provide uh, apart from solely rotation? Are there other constraints? Um, uh, okay, well, I'll answer two bits to that. First of all, um, I quite agree with you that the, iner the inversion results suggest that, if anything, there's a slight downturn uh, depending on the regularization you put in. But you can't, you, there is no splitting of the L equals zero, the radial modes, and therefore you're stuck with L equals one as your minimum. Uh, you can go up in frequency, but the modes get wider and it gets very much harder to measure. So I would argue that getting in, I mean, this is pushed to point two, which is quite something. Getting into, say, point one is not easy, and those who like a fast rotating core will tell you, well, it's a tiny bit in the middle. Okay, it's 5% of the radius. Okay, and so we have no way of getting there. To answer your second question, um, structure, I guess. I mean, you know, we guess what we think we understand the structure is. There are lots of questions. It might even, um, gosh, people know more than I do here, but was there previous mixing or all sorts of goodies like that? So we really would quite like to know. Okay, Susan. Besides the fact that I take exception with the boring part, <laughs> but uh, Agreed. one thing that actually was done by the group that Rachel did not present is that actually Sasha, using the data set of the observation that we were using, the six years of HMI data, using the error bars, essentially created, and the same sets of splittings, created two uh, uh, simulated splittings based on a rotation that actually had a fast rotating core. So we actually have run an inversion on simulated data to try to recover whether with the existing P-mode splitting, we can see something in the core. If you actually put no errors in the splittings and doing the inversion with the formal error bars that we observe, you can actually recover with P-modes a hint of there's something happening at the core, which is essentially pushing the inversion to something we'll never get because we always have, you know, uncertainties in the observation. If you actually do it with the uncertainty, we have no idea what's happening in the core. You know, and I don't remember offhand how, f how deep we can go with some confidence, but we definitely cannot use the P-modes to say what's happening in the inner, you know, let's say, you know, very center. I don't want to put a number right now. Yeah. Uh, independently of that, I want to say that actually I looked at Eric's approach, and when I tried to duplicate, I could not duplicate. I have actually some basic conceptual problem with trying to get a high precision by doing on purpose low resolution. You know, so you're essentially throwing the baby with the bat in this approach. The other thing that gets me somewhat annoyed in those is 
if you come with some G mode that suggests fast rotation, it has to be really very much close to the center because we have a very strong constraint, you know, close to the core but not at the core from the P mode. So you cannot just publish and say, I see a fast rotator without looking, is it compatible? You know, does that mean that what you think is three times faster should be really be 20 times faster because it's very much at the, you know, 1% or very small fraction of the core. So we get those, you know, claims that are incompatible with P modes and it would be nice for people to remember that we have a pretty good constraint with P modes, even if we don't go all the way down to the core. I agree. We've got Jan here. <laughs> Last two questions. Yvonne, we see G modes in stars only a thousand degrees hotter than the sun that are stable for four years. Why would you suspect short lifetimes in the sun? What's the reason for that? I don't. I think they're long lived. Um, essentially, it had to be short lived for, and perhaps Rafa should answer this question, really. Yeah, I think, uh, was a comment at the end? Yeah, go on. So it's not necessarily to be uh, short lifetimes. I mean, it can be long lifetime, but something else should be going. So the analysis we did shows that the peaks are slightly whiter, a few beans. And in fact, we are thinking that it's maybe because it could be some magnetic field that slightly put a splitting and then you have this. So it's not necessarily lifetime. Or for example, if the taco is moving uh, with the cycle or something like that, the cavity is slightly changing and your frequency is slightly changing. So it's not necessarily that observationally you see a line width that it's necessarily that you have a short lifetime. It's not necessarily damping. Yeah. yeah. And my response to that is, is that those trapped modes in the stars a thousand degrees hotter have got one boundary, which is a convective core. So they're dealing with a similar problem. And those stars often have got magnetic fields too. I'm not sure yeah. I see a big difference. So the, actually, so I I'm think, surprised at the idea of short lifetime. In I the think, sun. Don, the point that's really interesting is there's a good wide ranging theoretical discussion to be had here bringing in precisely what you say and what we see from other stars so that we can really take this from being, if you like, a niche solar problem and broaden it and then really understand where some of the constraints lie. That's why I would put actually understanding a bit more on my list of um, what we need to do. Uh, just two comments, if I may. One on the Eric's results. There's a very, very basic problem that was pointed out already in, in 1992, I think, by Kennedy, and that is that this technique would not be sensitive to G modes with art degree. That's really a consequence of the coupling calculations between the P and okay. G modes. Dr. Scuff made a very nice analysis of that, which was published many years after he made it, but I think in 2003. Uh, the second point is about the structure of the core, and uh, that would be very interesting. And there are several issues that we, we should worry about. One would be the persistence of a convective core. There's one very early in solar evolution. If that continues a bit further, then that would affect the structure of the very core. And the second might be effects of mass loss of the, from the early sun, which we can't really constrain very strongly with our present data. And having, again, Core structure, uh, modes telling more about the core would help constraining the composition structure and, and therefore also mass loss. So go for it. I love G modes, but I haven't seen them yet. Me neither. Okay, so are we We're done. Do you want to answer or something? No, no, <laughs> I, I can, can but agree. Okay, so then we, we just uh, thank again Yvonne. Now, Othman Benoman is going to talk about the bridge, about the uh, bridging the gap from the sun to the stars.
Oh, hi, everyone. First, I would like to thank the, the organizer to uh, invite me and uh, give me this opportunity to give a talk today. So, um, Astero Seismology has made quite great success uh, during the last few decades, uh, but all these success were built on the top of uh, the knowledge we acquired from Helio Seismology. And this is uh, particularly true if you consider solar analog and solar twins, or sunlight stars in general. The, um, here I will talk about those stars, and I will talk about the rotation of those stars. And as you all know here, Mike Thompson was working uh, and was contributing a lot in uh, the topic of rotation for, uh, for the sun. So probably one of the most interesting of his publications about that topic is this one, which is about the differential rotation, Sorry. differential rotation and dynamics of the solar interior, published in Science in 1996. So it was using the four months of Kong data, um, so freshly available data, and uh, to do a seismic invasion of the uh, one for the first time, precisely and accurately, the uh, a, grow, a good part of the, the, the sun, uh, deep inside the radiative zone. And this was possible because you have a resolved surface, and uh, this means that you have observation of low, intermediate, and high degree modes. Uh, these modes have different kernels, sensitive to different regions in depth and in radius, in, um, in latitude, which gives you the possibility of do, doing precise seismic inversion. When you are considering other stars, you do not have resolved stars. You have uh, a constellation effect which limits you to low degree L. And typically we have to infer anything about rotation, we need to rely on only L equal one and L equal two modes. And this means six azimuthal orders to, to, to infer anything about uh, rotation or differential rotation. The second problem you can face with the seismology is the fact that you have only photometric uh, observation. So um, in the sun, we do spectral velocimetry, which allows you to, to uh, have higher signal to noise than photometry, uh, simply because photometry is more sensitive to granulation noise at the surface. So you have lower signal to noise than ideally would, you would have. And spectral velocimetry is not possible, unfortunately, because you cannot observe hundreds of thousands of stars uh, from space using a space spectrometer. It's too difficult technically to, to perform. Despite these two difficulties, we had um, extremely successful space missions, uh, Coro and Kepler, which uh, allowed us to really understand the interior of stars, the, uh, the, the fundamental property of those stars, and to start to study the rotation. So before Coro, we had only a handful of stars for which you could detect any kind of pulsation. And you could get just basically new max, the, the bump of the pulsation. And it was very difficult to get any accurate measurement of the pulsation frequencies. Um, but after Coro and Kepler, we could detect precisely and accurately uh, uh, pulsation for more than 15,000 uh, solar-like stars. And a few hundred of them are main second sun-like stars. Uh, so main second solar like stars, so sun like stars. And they, interestingly, they cover the whole HR diagram such that you can start to do population study and evolution study. Um, so they go from the bottom of the main sequence up to the top of the red giant branch. And these numbers are certainly increasing, especially uh, regarding evolved solar like stars, simply because you have tests which is uh, quite efficient in uh, uh, observing those stars. So we can, as I said earlier, we can start to think about uh, looking at the rotation of those uh, sun-like stars um, uh, if, um, with, uh, with the Kepler data, which have uh, year-long observation. And because we're talking about sun-like stars, it's good to come back to the rotation profile of the sun that you have here, which is an updated version of the previous uh, one I, saw, I showed before from Mike again. Uh, in a review paper. So what you have here is a small but significant latino differential rotation confined to the uh, convective zone. Small because it never exceeds uh, really 30% uh, from equator to pole. And in the radiative zone, you have a quite uniform rotation. So this profile was surprising uh, when it came out first because 
it was expected that D players would rotate several times faster, or if not one order of magnitude faster than the envelope. And this is clearly not the case, showing that there's some kind of angular momentum transport happening into the radial direction from the D players to the envelope. Um, different hypotheses were formulated to explain this uh, and to, ans to understand what is transporting angular momentum transport. Probably one of the most interesting one is certainly the magnetic field. You, in, uh, in, uh, in space physics, you are facing plasma, a star is a plasma, and in, in, most, in, in plasma, you, it's very natural to have magnetic field. Uh, if you have a plasma, usually you have a magnetic field to some extent. And magnetic field is somewhat universal, therefore. And it governs the dynamo, uh, yeah, sorry, through the dynamo, if it governs the differential rotation, and it's related, uh, it have to some extent, to the supergranule. The, it's as well present at the surface, you have uh, coronal heating, which is probably uh, linked to magnetic field. So having, um, having an understanding of uh, the rotation may give us a clue of what's going on if you study the whole ensemble of stars. So the question whether it is here, whether it's the sun is a peculiar star or not in terms of rotation, and whether you can consider there is some kind of universal phenomenon which is responsible of that angular momentum transport. So, as I said earlier, if you try to uh, do the analysis of, uh, of, of the rotation of other stars and the sun, you are facing uh, difficulties compared to the sun. You cannot measure uh, splittings uh, for, uh, um, in function of N and L, simply because you have senior tunnels which are lower and it's difficult to extract all the individual uh, splittings for those modes, for the illegal two and illegal one. So this is, by the way, not the sun, is 16 sig A. And there is another difficulty here, is that you, in the case of the sun, you are looking at the star, you know the orbit of your satellite, or you know uh, the orbit of Earth, and you know that you are looking at the sun by the equatorial region, more or less. And you know, therefore, the stellar inclination. In, uh, stars are randomly distributed in, the, in space, in, uh, in, around us, and we don't know to which angle we look. We may look them at them by the pole, or we may look them by the equator, or anything in between. And this, um, this is uh, a problem because the uh, amplitude of the azimuthal orders is highly dependent on the stellar inclination. So that adds an unknown, which gives degeneracy between the split, uh, which gives degeneracy uh, between splitting and stellar inclination, and uh, it's difficult to actually. Uh, measure precisely the rotational splitting. So for the vast majority of stars, what you can do uh, is just measuring the average internal rotation. But if you do so, you cannot constrain the radial differential rotation. So what you need to do is to somewhat have uh, extra information and, uh, from the surface. And at the surface, you can measure the rotation by two way, mostly. Uh, using the photometric variability, which is assumed to be due to uh, uh, acti uh, active region uh, co-rotating with the surface of the star at the latitude at which they appear, uh, or you can use the spectroscopic V sine i. And then you can compare that with the average internal rotation you can get from the rotational splittings. If you do so, you, get, you can get some kind of figure like this for a given star. So the color is showing you the probability density function for the average internal rotation. The horizontal lines are showing you the photometric variability, and the curved one is the spectroscopic V sine i. So what is clear here is that there is no, all these three quantities are matching quite well, and there is no clear discrepancy, suggesting that there is some kind of uh, uniform rotation. If you repeat the operation on a larger ensemble of star, here I think there is 23 or 24 stars, um, and um, you, you can make this kind of plot, so where you have the average internal rotation in the y-axis and the surface rotation uh, in the x-axis, which is coming from the V sine i, disentangled from the sine i, and the radius coming from the seismology. So if there is angular momentum transport, we expect a one-one relation, and this is a, exactly what we see here. We have this dashed black line, and you see that data points are more or less aligned on this. 
you need to go further and try to evaluate how significant is this one-one um, uh, relation. And you can do so by just taking, uh, making a model of uh, a model which uh, assumes that there is no angular momentum transport, and then uh, you have to do it as uh, in the zero edge main seconds because during evolution, uh, a star will have a core which is contracting continuously, such that uh, if there is no angular momentum transport, it will spin up, and the envelope is expanding. Therefore, you expect a spin up, a spin down of the envelope, such that the contrast. Uh, should increase over time. And then a zero edge mean sequence model would give you the lower limit on the contrast between average internal rotation and the surface rotation. And this is what you have here with this red line, uh, red dash dot line. And you see that most of the data points are below this line. Uh, clearly it's indicating that there is some kind of nearly uniform rotation in a vast majority of sun-like stars. There is this star except an exception we have, but we think it's an outlier. So this kind of uh, evidence of nearly uniform rotation was uh, verified with an independent method from Nielsen and collaborator in 2017, which was just trying to measure independently the rotation in the radiative zone and in the convective zone for a uh, set of uh, uh, stars from Kepler. It is as well something we see in more evolved stars. So in evolved stars, we see a core, uh, a core rotating slightly faster than the envelope, but the contrast is much smaller, a factor of few compared to what we expect. We expect 100 or 1,000 of contrast. And this is something we see as well in some of the A-type stars. So there's somewhat something, uh, a phenomenon which is, uh, or several phenomena which are acting all at once for uh, the whole evolution of stars, so from the, from, any, uh, from the bottom of the main sequence up to the, the top of the red giant branch. So is it the magnetic field? Well, I would think that it's perhaps this because it's, uh, the simplest explanation is usually the best. Uh, the next step is uh, to try to think about how to constrain the differential rotation in latitude. So that's uh, relatively difficult to do because as I said, we have the rotational kernels, if we come back to them, um, we can measure only those, only those, and most of them are sensitive uh, to equatorial regions, uh, except the L equal to M plus minus one, which uh, more or less have sensitivity uh, around 40 to 60 degrees of latitude. So we need to use that, that's the only information we have to extract any information about latitude and differential rotation. So one thing we can do is to do air coefficient decomposition, and then uh, for those who are familiar, you, have a, you can do A1 and A3. And A3 is uh, interestingly only dependent on the, uh, the, the, the differential rotation. Uh, a positive A3 will give you uh, um, um, a, a solar-like rotation, uh, anti, uh, negative A3 will give you anti-solar rotation. So you can use that to robustly and uh, precisely determine whether the star is rotating slower in the pole, so a solar-like rotator, uh, or uh, opposite is rotating faster in the pole, an anti-solar rotation. So if you do so using uh, the Kepler data, which are uh, the, the best ones, for which you have at least two, three years of observation, um, you can make this kind of histogram behind me. So where you have the, the number of stars in function of detection probability, so this is a, basically a detection at one sigma. This is a two sigma for anti-solar, and here opposite for solar-like. So what we can see is two things. First, none of the stars for which we could um, try to measure the differential rotation pass the one sigma detection threshold when uh, in the anti-solar side. It means that there is no clear evidence of anti-solar rotation. However, you have an excess of stars which have a solar-like rotation, with uh, 13 of them which pass the one sigma detection threshold, and uh, five of them which are passing the two sigma, and most of those five are actually uh, beyond that, at four sigma. So this, is, this means that statistically speaking, uh, in the Kepler field, if you take uh, stars, you sun-like stars, you have mostly solar-like rotator. And at that stage, it's not so much inconsistent with hydro models because um, 
you expect uh, anti-cellular radiation for a relatively slow rotator. As far as I understand, slower than the sun or the boundaries around uh, the solar rotation. And here, what we have is stars which are rotating anything between five to 50 days, but with the vast majority of those stars rotating faster than the sun, faster than 30 days. So we have a, uh, it's, it's relatively consistent. The next step was really to try to see whether we can constrain the magnitude of the uh, differential rotation. And uh, so we did, we tried to do that on the best detection. So the 13 stars for which you, you have a one sigma detection at least. And as I said earlier, we have not so many constraints. We have only A1 and A3, uh, the two A coefficient we could measure. And we need to somewhat simplify the rotation profile such that we can um, somewhat get, get some information about the Latinian differential rotation. And modulo some assumption, you can uh, link the A1 coefficient to the average rotation into the radiative zone and the A3 coefficient to uh, the uh, magnitude of the differential rotation in the latitude, uh, in the convective zone. The um, one thing to, to insist on is that because the LGL2, uh, the LGL2 M, LGL1 rotational kernels are not traveling anywhere near the, the pole, what we can have is uh, the sensitivity to, uh, to, to the differential rotation up to maximum 60 or 50 degrees of latitude. And this means that if you, you should consider only our measurement reliable between the equatorial region and mid latitudes. Beyond that, you have large uncertainty and certainly inaccuracy. So, here are the results from that. So if you look at um, this panel here, you have uh, the 13 stars I was talking about before. And what you can notice, so here's the sun, and this is delta omega uh, for at between equatorial region and 45 degrees of latitude divided by omega at the equator. And what you can notice is that in average, those stars have a, a a rotation which is twice faster in the equator compared to mid latitude, which is much more than what you can get for the sun. And the sun is more 10 to 15%. So this is a bit puzzling. And um, discussing with uh, Hideyuki Hota, he was proposing that uh, it could be a weak large scale magnetic field complete with a strong small scale magnetic field that would generate a stronger differential rotation than what you could see in solar models. Uh, but one of the problems that uh, seems to happen in his simulation is that you get more cylindrical, differential, uh, cylindrical rotation profile. However, our data, we cannot rule out completely uh, cylindrical rotation, but uh, during statistical tests, we found that it was probably more likely to have a solar-like rotation profile. It's completely data-driven, so it's not, and, and the, the odds were not so strong, but um, so it's, it's a bit puzzling. So. Um, we might have more solar-like rotation and a cylindrical, but model suggests the opposite. The second hypothesis were, uh, was proposed by Hiromoto Shibashi, which was basically if you extract, uh, you have a strong wind from the, the pole, you extract a lot of mass, and then you lose angular momentum, and which would create a uh, differential rotation. But um, I discussed uh, with uh, Douglas uh, some time ago, and he was suggesting that this would, should affect only a, sh a small shear, a small layer uh, at the surface. And uh, what we measure is actually something happening deep inside. So it, it's probably not that. So this is still an open question. So what is happening for those stars? Uh, nevertheless, we have to emphasize that those 13 stars represent only 30% of the ensemble of stars we, could analy we, we analyzed. For the 70% remaining, we couldn't detect the differential rotation, probably because this differential rotation is comparable or weaker than the sun. So in that sense, the sun is just among the 70% and it's just a normal star. If you have the, one last thing I wanted to say is that if you have the differential rotation uh, profile to some extent, you can start to do more than uh, if you don't have it. 
You can uh, cross, for example, this information with the photometric uh, variability if you have any photometric variability. Uh, we could do that for this star, HD 173701, and which shows a very strong variability between anything between 8 to 40 days. And it's interesting because it's a, a star which has more or less the same mass as the sun, same age, but it's rotating relatively faster, 20 days instead of 30 days in the interior. And this is one of those stars which have a, a mid latitude which are twice slower than the equator. And so if we cross this information between photometric variability with the rotation profile we had, we can uh, find where, where is the latitude of the active region and how they vary over time, so make some kind of butterfly diagram. So this is what you have here, which was published in Basel and Collaborator. So there's a, a small problem of screen cut, but the, the, this thing is not so important. So what you need to look at is this thing. So what you see is that um, most of the active region seems to be below 50 degrees of latitude, which is more or less consistent with what we see in the sun. And you have as well uh, a pattern, and in some phase you have uh, active region appearing at high latitude and other time you, you, you have low latitude active region. It's hard to say if there's any kind of cycle here because we have only four years of observation. So it would be interesting to look at uh, what tests will tell us when it will revisit this field, this star, uh, because we can measure, we may not see any pulsation with tests, but we may have a photometric variability which would allow us to see at other epoch what is happening and therefore identify if there's some, some kind of actual cycle, cycle in this, uh, this star. All right, so that was uh, all. So here's just a summary. So we can say that asteroid seismology nowadays is more or less in the stage we, we had in terms of possibility uh, that, uh, to what we could do for the sun in the 80s and 90s before a gong and before um, Soho. So what is, um, evident from the current uh, analysis uh, we have is that there is evidence of uniform rotation in sun-like stars and um, that there's maybe some kind of universal mechanism which is not supporting angular momentum because we see it every, in, at every stage of evolution of, of, uh, of uh, solar-like stars. Latino difference rotation, there is two kind of, it seems that there is two, two, two kind of uh, stars, so those that are similar to the sun uh, in terms of differential rotation and latitude, uh, representing the majority and uh, extreme cases that we still need to understand. Um, it would be interesting to have uh, a plateau mission which will be successful because uh, we would be able to increase the statistics and be able to perhaps see something uh, and understand what's going on. All right, thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Okay. Yeah, very nice talk. A um, couple, two comments and then a question. So first comment, uh, the strong differential rotation was also found in Donahue 1996, hmm? who measured uh, differential rotation from the Mount Wilson calcium data. So this is surf, uh, surface differential rotation at multiple epochs. So the okay. difference in rotation periods of a given evoc. They found ones just as strong as, as you did, so there's additional evidence uh, for In that. which kind of star was it? I think I, it was probably K type FG and K types yeah. found mostly main sequence stars. Mm, yeah. Okay. Uh, the second one from my talk yesterday, um, you know, if there's an observed limit to the spin down of the sun-like stars and a theoretical prediction that anti-solar rotation happens somewhere beyond the sun's age, the inference is that there is no anti-solar differential rotation. So it's uh, sort of interesting to, to see that you were, weren't able to detect it. And then my question is, uh, what is your selection function exactly? You, I thought you said there was sort of a bias toward fast rotating stars. Yes. How did that happen? Do you... Well, we, we just took the, the best detection from Kepler. And it happens that uh, we are G-type star and F-type stars. F-type stars are rotating relatively faster than the sun. So that's why. So it's just uh, the fact that we are, the sun is a relatively slow rotator compared to other G-type and F-type stars, that's it. 
So we are, yes, we, we are biased toward higher, fast rotation. Just a comment about your, um, the last, or the penultimate slide, yeah, on that one. So I think you, you might be aware one of our students, PhD students, just recently published a paper um, using frequency shifts of mm. nodes of different degree to say something about the distribution of activity or the latitudinal distribution of activity, which suggests for this star that things are rather more spread out than the sun. Uh, rather, sorry? Rather more spread out uh, than spread on the sun. Okay. We can discuss that. Um, you might have said it, but was there anything special about those 13 stars with strong differential rotation that you noticed compared to the rest of the sample as maybe yeah, I, I forgot to mention it in the, I forgot to mention it in the, the conclusion. We, we try to look uh, dependencies on metallicity, on Rossby number, on uh, mass, and on rotation rate, and we didn't find any, any kind of tendency or any trend, so we don't know exactly why. Uh, those stars are different. Any other question? No? So I have a comment or a question. So what is the sensitivity that you have at higher uh, latitudes here, close to the poles? Sorry? What is the sensitivity? You have the same sensitivity from the equator to the pole? No, no. You, well, the we account for the uncertainty in the rotation profile here. So uh, that's why you have asymmetrical uncertainties, by the way. So uh, you are more sensitive to mid-latitude and below, and at higher latitude you, you lose resolution. And you see it, the uncertainty on the, on the on, for example, this, this data point here is highly skewed, so, you, so, so yeah. Thank you. So let's thank uh, Osman again. <laughs>